Welcome to worship as we look at another passage in Luke this afternoon from Luke chapter um, 16 and verses 1 through 15. Maybe you've noticed this past year that there's a new Spider-Man sequel. You may not be a big movie fan or a Marvel comic fan, but the Marvel comic book media group has launched several, and the latest one, which is in, uh, entitled uh, "The Way No Way Home, uh, came out this past year. So, you may not be a Spider-Man fan, but I've got a picture of a couple of them here. Our grandson's down there in the lower left. He pulled his mask off for the picture so everybody would know this is the Spider-Man I am. <laughs> I think it was a Spider-Man birthday party. All the little friends came all dressed up. It is a very popular theme, and Spidey is a popular character right now. Columbia Pictures took a bit of a gamble that surely paid off at the box office with this most recent one because their script writers included three separate versions of the iconic superhero, kind of mixing previous pictures of him and scenes with him in such a way that these versions were drawn into, um, tied together temporarily with a loose bow for this particular movie. But all the versions of the Spider-Man persona have a similar backstory, and that is Peter Parker. Peter Parker is a newly imbued with superhuman strength a young man. He has resilience, and of course he has the characteristics of a spider to be able to hold his hand and shoot the web up the side of a building and instantly swing, leap through the air, come down from heights, and land to face off with the bad guys. Uh, he stops criminals when he has a chance, sometimes tying them up, sometimes escaping in time to find other ways to bring them down. Well, in this movie, he discovers that the same criminal he has come up against has actually taken the life of his uncle, a dear family member, and his mentor. And with his dying breath, his uncle leaves Peter Parker with one of the most memorable superhero mottos of all time. He says, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. And so Peter Parker decides to live in honor of that statement, seeking not to squander the gifts he's been given from that point on. Now his quote may stir some children and adults to think about what power they have and perhaps what responsibility might come with it. Others may breathe a sigh of relief saying, I don't have any great power. I got nothing to worry about. So today's message is a bit of a challenge to both groups of people. We may not have great power, but we do have great responsibility. And these two truths that Jesus shares with us throughout his ministry and the implication of these truths can be found in our scripture passage today, reading from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and chargers were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do. So that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to be to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one 
and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's quite a section of scripture, quite a parable that Jesus presents here. It's actually the end of a group of parables. And when we're tacking, tackling a parable, one of the first things we try to figure out is who we're supposed to identify with in the passage. In this parable, it doesn't take us long to see ourselves placed in the, the position of the shrewd manager. Parables don't present perfect parallels with reality, but rather express practical, a moralistic, and theological concepts that Jesus desires his followers to understand and to embrace. When they are part of a string of parables, as this one is, each section contains truth to be contemplated, but it's all these put together and woven together that form Jesus' point, his message here. In this case, we reach back into chapter 15, where Luke is weaving together, um, remembers as Jesus is weaving together this message for the Pharisees, who criticized Christ for the time he spent with sinners and tax collectors. It's a message for his disciples as well because they are listening in. And so we see in Luke chapter 15 where these parables actually begin. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So this is the beginning of a series of parallels. What's the message these parables that continue from Luke 15 and verse 1 into chapter 16? Well, let's outline the lessons for just a moment that Jesus is sharing here and how we get to chapter 16 into the tying the larger conversation together uh, so that we can un up apprehend and begin to make more sense of it. The parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin is presented here in Luke 15 verses 3 through 10. And this presents a message of hope for those who have gone astray. The parables are understood as God going to the sinner, bringing them back into the relationship with himself. He pursues that which is lost, and so we are saved. The return of those who are lost is a cause for great rejoicing. And then in the parable of the loving father, we often talk about the parable of the prodigal son, but the story really is about the loving father in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus expands on the sheep and the coin. Now it's a human being that is being treasured and brought back. Not only is the return of the son who is lost a cause for rejoicing, the happy father willingly forgives the son who turns from the path of self-destruction. But we're left with a question at the end of the parable. Will the envious older brother who is resentful, will he join the party? Will he renew his relationship with the father or turn and walk the path of Cain, allowing his pride and anger to rule over him. And so the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and then the prodigal son and the loving father precede this scripture that we have read in Luke 16 in our text for today, where a shrewd manager continues the narrative of redemption that has already been lined out. Having established that God pursues us in these parables, forgives us, and rejoices at our at our reconciliation, the party time, in all of those, Jesus is free to turn to the question of our past choices and how we should now act in the light of them. And so this parable, which is directed to the disciples rather than the Pharisees, calls for them to follow in the example of generosity given to us that extend and extend that generosity to others. Jesus' conclusion follows these parables and it is this one cannot serve God and money that's where he sums it up he's got he's got a coin a sheep valuable things that are lost and finally a child of his and they're all brought back but the end of his message is it is you can't serve God and money so he leaves his disciples with a point even as he is squared off with the Pharisees where he began it cuts to the heart of both the Pharisee and the disciple it sets before them a clear dichotomy Opposition to God is not just defined by bad choices and sinful acts or dubious perfections. It's also defined by the pursuit of wealth, comfort, and earthly influence over the kingdom of God. Seeking first all these things, then hoping God will throw in the kingdom of God as well. In effect, reversing the order of what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom of God. 
The Pharisees hated what Jesus said here. They would hear in this message a condemnation of their lifestyle as well as a dismissal of the sins of the people Jesus was spending time with. They could not comprehend that the relationship with the sinner was more important to God than condemnation of their sin. Their preoccupation was with the law of Moses and they could not grasp the grace of Christ, God in their presence. They failed to see that in Christ, God sent his son to remove the condemnation and to restore the relationship. He cancels the biggest debt of all, if you will, in forgiving sin. And so in this passage, he has created a scenario in which the hero, which is an interesting way to put it, has cheated and swindled, and only at the last moment, with the certainty of unemployment and disaster looming on his doorsteps, he changes his ways and thinks, what can I do to change this quickly for the future? The shrewd manager is not a person to be idolized or celebrated. Jesus admits that he has used the methods and the means of his day and his time and his position, and yet he concludes there's something good that we learn from him. Even though we don't want to be like him in shrewd business dealings that steal or reduce our, our, our boss's profit intentionally to save ourselves. He's presented here in the parable as a hero for one reason. He set before us making the correct choice to look to the future. He planned ahead. He got desperate before he did it. But he's our hero in the sense that he planned ahead. And then Jesus finishes it with, because uh, these treasures from heaven are going to be the result in our case. So the master commended the dishonest manager in verse 8 and 9 for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Notice that by means of unrighteous wealth. Don't you be unrighteous in using your wealth, but by the means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Everything we have power over is temporary, and we have no power of our own. Jesus is telling his disciples that they need to change their perspective if they want to follow him. They need to look heavenward with eyes firmly fixed on the eternal prize in Jesus. Now many choices are presented to you and to me every single day. And they'll have one of two outcomes. Either to build unrighteous wealth here or true riches in heaven. While sins are forgiven with the costly grace of God freely given to us. Pursuit of wealth for personal comfort, social status. Binds us into service and to sin in a deep and dangerous way. Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of God in the way that you plan for your future. He's te his teaching is reflected in this statement that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. His statement, of course, <laughs> reminds us that it's impossible for anyone to enter the kingdom of God on his own merit, his own wealth, his own status in the world, his own Facebook page, his own efforts, whatever we want to add on to that that comes from our works. Notice Jesus, when he says it's hard for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom, does not use the term inherit the kingdom because inheritance would focus on how it's a gift from God to all who enter and by grace. He said it's hard for a rich man to enter, <laughs> to, to make the choice and to go through that door of stripping away that which matters most to us for that which matters most to God and ultimately our future where riches are counted not in terms of monetary standards, but in terms of the true riches found in Christ alone. And it means letting go of things that we would tend to clutch. Jesus is not against anyone based on what they own or don't own. He is making the observation that the more we clutch, the harder it is to enter the kingdom of God. Those who have much must think about how much they're giving up or how much they're devaluing it in comparison to putting Christ first. And so we come back to our title screen. There's gifts here not to be squandered. Notice something else in this parable which is a freeing truth. 
We possess nothing. This manager in the story has no wealth of his own. He's managing the owner's accounts the whole time. None of this, if you will, is his money. That's why it's a bit shrewd when he says, hey, my boss will take 50% less if you pay him today. He's kind of hoping he can make the deal, keep himself paid, and his boss staved off for a while. But we cannot claim anything for ourselves like this manager. Our wealth, our land, our health, our skills, our potential, everything we have or ever will have our gifts from God. This is the acknowledgement of what we said earlier, that we have no power of our own, but we do have great responsibility. As Jesus says here, he's been fa he who has been faithful in a little will be trusted with a lot. And I think most of us, <laughs> at least those of us in this room, and maybe most who are hearing the message, would count ourselves among those who have very little compared to the vast wealth of the world and the, the wealthy of the world's, in the world's goods. Well, what will we do with what we've been given? We have great responsibility. The prodigal son and the older brother, the lost sheep and the coin, the disciples and the Pharisees, you and me, we all have a moment in our lives where we find ourselves in the shoes of this shrewd manager. Like the manager, all we have is not our own, but gifts given to us. We count our blessings, as the old hymn says, one by one. Name them one by one. Like the manager, we realize that what we've been, that we've been unwise with our gifts in times past, squandering them for our own gain. But now as we look to the future, we want to make different kinds of decisions. That is the thrust of the story, the parable here. This is where we're called upon to ask the question, what should I do next? Jesus answers again, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. The choice the manager makes is based not upon his present needs, but rather on what he hopes for in the future. He is looking ahead. The pearl of wisdom we are called to embrace in this parable, this is it. That Christian forward thinking is not just a matter of hours or days or years, but of our eternal relationship with the Father. That takes place not only in how we steward our monies, but also our time, our resources, even in our prayers, even in our prayers for one another. And when we read the New Testament, we see over and over again in the letters of Paul where he said, I'm praying for you. I'm thankful always for your, the faith that you have and the love that you have for one another in Ephesians um, chapter 1 along verse 15 and 16. And in Colossians chapter 1, and in uh, Philippians chapter 1, within the first four verses of both of those letters, he says, I'm so thankful for you, I'm praying for you. And so uh, even in our own prayer life, as we seek to focus on the future, how do we pray for one another? Do we pray, uh, Father, please add all these things that that Fred is asking about, no, oh, by the way, throw in the kingdom of God? Or do we one by one for each other pray first for the centrality of Christ and the kingdom of God in each other's lives? Things that will truly be joy, eternal, uh, fruitful, meaningful, and paving the way for the use of everything else we're given. I know it's so easy to get caught up in the physical details of our daily life, and those physical details are important. God counts the hairs on our head. He is the healing bomb from Gilead, as we sang earlier. But that healing bomb has a source, and the source is in Christ. And the source of that kingdom is Christ himself. So we seek that first, and then these things will be added. And God knows our, our need. He knows the timing. He knows the, uh, the pace at which he is accomplishing his good purpose in us from beginning to end. So the choice the manager makes is based not on present need, but what he hopes for in the future, what he's going to put first in his life from here on. And that's where Christ goes with this parable, meeting his disciples by the end of the parable with what's best for them, the wisdom we're called to embrace. Our great responsibility then is to seek guidance from that relationship. The generous, gracious heart of the Father is our guide for good stewardship. 
like the prodigal son who spent a lot of time wasting the, <laughs> the inheritance he had until he woke up one day eating the corn shucks in the pig pen and said, what am I doing here? What is my future going to be? I think I'll go back to dad and just say, I've blown it. <laughs> I don't know what's left, but here I am. And his father runs out to meet him. That's the heart of the generous father because he's the source of all those blessings. He is the owner of the field. He is the owner of eternity. He's the owner of the universe. He's a generous father. And so we learn both fiscal and spiritual responsibility when we prayerfully consider the gifts that we have been given. Whether we find ourselves donating to a church or a charity or buying a family home, this wisdom can be applied that the use of material wealth for our own need and even comfort is not necessarily sinful. <laughs> it is needful part of making decisions, but the parable warns us against placing those purposes before our service to God. Our great responsibility is to take what we've been given and put it toward an eternal purpose and life lived with God and one another. And so in doing this, we'll be, we have been faithful with the unrighteous wealth that once held us in its grip and gain in its place the true riches that come from service to God, as Christ says here, eternal wealth. Let's pray about that. Father, we thank you for your spirit who guides us, who helps us to become better stewards of all that you have given us that is not ours of our own, but that you've placed in our hands to make decisions with. Help us be wise with whatever unrighteous wealth that is placed in our hands. Help us be wise with our prayer lives and our priorities and the decisions that we make day to day, that we would seek first your kingdom, that we would seek to please you, and that we would look forward to the eternal inheritance, inheritance that is ours in Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen.